Good morning again, Redeemer. If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts 17, we're looking at verses uh, 16 through 34. I'll go ahead and start reading, and uh, at the beginning of the sermon, I'll put it uh, in context a little bit for us. This is God's Word. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took hold of him and brought him to the Areopagus and and saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I pass along and observe the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is not actually not far from each of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to us by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with him. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we uh, turn our hearts to your word and pray in these next moments that you would indeed be our teacher. Father, I pray that you would indeed use your word to conform us to the image of Jesus. Would that we see the beauty of Jesus in our text and also who we are empowered and enabled to be as we are united with him by faith and indwelled by your spirit. Father, your longing is to not simply to redeem us, but to redeem us and to begin this beautiful and long work of making us like Christ. And so, Father, would you use the words of your servant submitting to your text to make us more like Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So looks can be deceiving. There have been numerous behind-the-scenes documentaries on how uh, advertisers and those who market products via commercials uh, deceive us. And these, those who are making these documentaries, documentaries want us to be able to see behind the counterfeit. Fast food companies are the worst. We now know that in their commercials, they inject their meat with fillers to make it look more plump. Those buns that you see on the commercials are spray painted. The number of fries that you get in your uh, McDonald's box, they pinch the bottom of it and give you the illusion at the top that your fries are teeming and, and overflowing. You order a medium and you order a large, and the difference is more ice in the large. (laughs) These companies actually hire food stylists, and their job is to make 
their food look mouth-watering on television. This even isn't even diving into what's in some of the food that we eat. That what these documentary, documentaries are trying to do is to give us, as the consumer, eyes to see behind the counterfeit. Looks can be deceiving. Paul is in Athens, and Athens would have been a sight to behold. Everybody knew about Athens. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and famous philosophers called Athens home. Some of the best literature and art in the world was created there. That it would have been one of the most beautiful cities in that part of the world. Greg, will you show this photo? This is the Acropolis. This is Athens' citadel, and much of this is still present today. That there are temples, there are theaters where plays could happen, the Athenian Games, a cousin to the Olympics, is there, and that's out of marble. Thank you, Greg. This would have been a sight to behold, to go to this city. Pliny, the elder, who was a philosopher and an author in Paul's day, writes that there were 73,000 gods or statues of gods in Athens, in their temples, in their altars, in their marketplaces, in their homes, that people bowed down to and worshipped. When Paul gets to Athens, he doesn't see it as being beautiful. He sees it as being destructive and dangerous. He was not deceived by the counterfeit. What do you think when you think about idols? In Tim Keller's book, Counterfeit Gods, he actually begins the book by citing Acts 16. And he says that most of us, when we think about the term idol, we think of a statue of a, of a make-believe deity that people come to, or we think about the Parthenon, or we think about these things in ancient history where people would go and sacrifice and bow down. But Keller makes the case that that is outward idolatry. He says the, the most sinister form of idolatry is idolatry of the heart. And he goes on to say that, that most of us think about idolatry as sacrificing at the temple of Aphrodite. He says, but we may not bow down to Aphrodite, but, but women can be driven into depression and in eating disorders because they have become obsessed with body image. It's idolatry. He says, men, we may not offer our children at the idol of child sacrifice, right? Worshiping Artemis. He says, but we can neglect our children as we chase achievement and higher places in business. Keller goes on to say that an idol is anything that is so central to your life that should you lose it, your life would be worthless. He says, our hearts deify our idols. And they become central to our lives. And we think that they will give us these four things. Significance, safety, satisfaction, and security. That if we're looking outside of the gospel for those four things, it's an idol. And he says an idol and the relationship we have to it is worship. That's why you see Paul using worship over and over in our passage. Their security, satisfaction, safety, significance is rooted in created things. And if we look around the world, we would notice that our world is no different. The human heart is an idol making factory. We see it in ourselves, and we see it in others. And this passage isn't necessarily about rooting out our own idolatry. That's for another day. This passage shows us what does a witness do when he or she encounters vast idolatry? We sing, nothing compares to Jesus. And by God's grace, I hope we mean that. 
By God's grace, I hope that the Lord is our portion and our shield and our strength and our redemption. By God's grace, I pray that as we sing that, that there is nothing more valuable than Jesus, that that what we're saying is there is one person who will rescue your soul from hell. There is one person who will be with you in death. There is one person who will raise you in life. There is one person in whom we have redemption. There is one person, and it's Jesus. And what we're saying is that other people and other things and other causes and other possessions, that those things pale in comparison and import to him. Well, what happens when we as believers taste and know of God's grace and then we run into people who don't? They have been deceived and are being deceived. What does that do to our souls? That's what we're looking at in this passage. And here's what I think we're going to see. As we aspire to be faithful witnesses, you'll encounter grief. Grief. Grief over the idolatry that you see. Second, that the Lord by His Spirit is calling you to grind. And I'll define that later. Grief, grind, and lastly, the Lord's going to use you to be a conduit of grace. The grace of God that is offered to the world through faithful witnesses. Let's look at the grief of a witness. For context, remember where we are. Paul was in Philippi. He was asked to leave, and in humility, he left. He went to Thessalonica to preach the gospel, and they were going to hurt him there too. And so his uh, compadres snuck him out of the city at night. Then he gets to Berea and the Jews from Thessalonica found out he was there. And so he came there. And so now it reads as if they put him on a ship and sent him over to Athens. Now, that's important because in the next two chapters, we're going to see that that Paul is about to embark upon a season of peace. When he gets to Corinth in the next chapter, Jesus comes to him and says, hey, don't you worry about them. I have many in this city who are followers of my name. They will not touch you. And so we're told he stays in Corinth for an entire year and a half and nobody lays a finger on him. In the next chapter after that, he goes to Ephesus. And how long does he stay in Ephesus? For two years. So think about the stretch of the journey. Paul has been running from city to city to city, but now from Athens and Corinth and Ephesus, Jesus says, no, brother, they're not going to lay a hand on you. Be at peace and do my work. And it is in that context of experiencing peace around him from men that we're told that his spirit was provoked on the inside. So let me get this right. You got peace out here. They're not chasing you down. I would, man, that is like amazing. And just when he's doing that, the Holy Spirit says like, sure, right? He said, his spirit is provoked. That word for provoked, it can mean anger. It can also mean intense grief, sorrow, and sadness. And it's in kind of the passive tense, which means that, that it happens to him, that, that something or someone is causing him to feel this grief. Now, when do we feel grief? I think we feel grief over our own sin. We feel grief when we live in a broken and fat, fractured world. We feel grief when we bury those we love, don't we? C.S. Lewis, in his book, A Grief Observe, his stepson writes the intro to the book. And his stepson is trying to give us a picture of this man that, that we honor and revere, but when he's talking about what he saw in his stepson and his stepfather, whom he called Jack, he says, look, when my mother died, I could handle it because I was young and I had other loves. I had life in front of me. But for Jack, Jack had no one but me. And so when you read a grief observe, see as soon as his stepson says, man, grief was really, really hard. Because his wife that he married later in life passed. That's not the grief that we're talking about in this passage. 
This grief in verse 16 comes when Paul sees that the city is full of idols. He saw statues and altars and objects fashioned by hands out of wood and metal and stone, which is why he says in verse 29, we ought not think that God is like this. He's not like gold or silver or stone or any image formed by the art and imagination of men. Now, why does this cause grief when he sees a city full of idols? Why does that stir grief in the heart of the apostle Paul? First, because I think Paul knows the word. It's the reason why Zach read Exodus 20. It's one of the Ten Commandments. It's the first two commandments where the Lord tells Moses, I, like I brought you out of bondage. I delivered you from slavery. I brought you to myself. And therefore, because I am the deliverer, guess what? You to have no other gods besides me. That's the first and the second. And you are not to carve out anything in my likeness or in the likeness of things above or things beneath. You're not to do that. Why? Because I'm a jealous God. I share my glory with nothing and no one. And I visit the iniquity of fathers to the third and fourth generation. And so when Paul goes into Athens and he sees thousands of idols and he sees idol worship, he is grieved because they are living in rebellion, direct rebellion against the commandment of God. He's grieved over the state of their souls. He's grieved because God's name is not glorified in Athens. He's grieved, right? Because all of this is happening. This is what's causing this holy grief in the Apostle Paul. Now, how did it happen? One, because he knew the word. But did you notice that while Paul was waiting, he's waiting on his friends to get there. And so Paul takes a walk around the city. And it says that Paul saw with his own eyes that the city was full of idols. Think about those two postures right there of an unhurried life where we can be where we are. That we're not turning to our phones to scroll and get into this alternate universe, but that we are actually where we are in a particular place at a particular time. We're there and that his eyes are looking around the city that he's in. It's his waiting and his watching. It's his seeing and his being patient and present that that coupled with the word of God, that it stirs up this grief for the city. Jesus says that in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, blessed are you who mourn. Blessed are you who weep. He isn't just saying when you weep over your sin or injustice. Yeah. You'll weep when you see unbelief. And it'll crush your heart when you see family and friends and coworkers chasing after gods who are no gods. When you see the glory of God being shared with the world, it'll break your heart. It ought to. And if it doesn't, it's usually tied to three things. We're not letting the word of God and the character of God shape our vision of God. We're softening his character, rubbing off those parts that this world does not want to hear. He is merciful. He is loving. He is kind. He is abounding in steadfast love. But our God shares no glory with anyone. He hates idolatry. It stinks and it's repulsive to him. And if we don't feel the weight of that, then what we're doing, beloved, is letting the world shape who God is. If we don't feel the brokenness of the world, it's probably because 
we're too hurried. We can't worship at the altar of busyness and expect to notice the idolatry in the world around us. India Ari says, slow down, baby. You're moving too fast. You got your hands in the air with your feet on the gas. Slow down. What is she saying? That a part of the Christian life, we have to reject busyness and reject overworking and reject our feet on the gas going from meeting to meeting and thing to thing and cause to cause that there is space, there is sacred space in the life of believers to slow down and to linger and to be present where our feet is and to not get at a stoplight and be so restless to grab our phones and scroll that we don't see the idols and the real people around us, that I believe that if we embrace these postures of of being in the Word and letting the character of God shape who He is, and if we were to slow down and to be present and just to take walks and to ask these questions, what are people around me trusting in? What are they finding? significance in what makes them feel safe and secure here it is beloved when we practice those I guarantee you you will see idolatry and you will see it vast it will be beauty it will be power it will be violence it will be pleasure it will be fame you name it and you'll see it but we're too busy and not present And our hearts don't break. And what Paul is calling us to, and Jesus is calling us to, slow down. Take in. Pay attention and look out. And your heart will be broken. But what does it cause Paul to do now that his spirit is provoked? And see, I think the emphasis here isn't necessarily on his engagement with the Jews in the synagogue Luke kind of mentions that in passing, but the focus of the passage, I think, is down there in verse 22. That's where we actually get the words that Paul spoke. And so we've seen how Paul engages with Jews in the previous chapters. We're going to hone in kind of on this section here. It moves him to grind, the grind of a witness. Now, grind can mean to reduce something down to smaller particles. I grind the beans of my coffee every morning. Do not give me pre-ground coffee. I want to smell the beans. I want to hear the the gears turning in the machine. I want to grind it down, right? Grind can also mean to rub two things together, but there's a slang use of grind, and that's what I'm after. So one one of my favorite things to watch during the pandemic was The Last Dance. It's the, 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 the documentary about Michael Jordan. And Michael Jordan entered this stretch where he had to play the Detroit Pistons, the bad boys. And they had Bill Lambeer and Isaiah Thomas and Joe Dumars, right? And, and Jordan, right? He's like, man, that was the hardest team I've ever played. They were physical. They will bump you, knock you off your spot. They were hard to play. And you know what Michael Jordan did? He says, I had to gain weight. And they showed Michael Jordan really in the 90s in the workout room. Like this brother is starting to lift weights and to gain weight. He says, because the next time I play them, I'm going to bring the punishment to them. He was saying that, look, sometimes skill isn't enough. Talent isn't enough. You got to grind. You got to get into the weight room and mass up and bulk up. And when you come back, you take the fight to them. That's grinding. Think about the Memphis Grizzlies. From 2010 to 2019, it's called the grit and grind style of basketball. They had Mark Gasol and Zach Randolph and Mike Connolly. And they were known locally and nationally as Grind City. Now, why? Because they put pressure on the ball. They had the most steals in 2011 out of any NBA team. They had the highest number of points scored in the paint 
the same year by anyone in the NBA. That's how they got the nickname Grind City. Because we're going to play aggressive defense and we're going to bring the pain. You're going to get beat up coming down here. Grind City. When you read this passage, Paul is grinding. He is taking the fight to those who are idolaters. He is not being Mr. Nice Guy, right? He was timid, not timid, he was humble. Back over there in Philippi, you want me to leave, I'll leave, right? He's really humble and tender, and the witness of God has to be humble and tender. But what you're going to see in this passage, the witness of God is called to be tough and courageous and bold and to confront idolatry and to confront the lies of the world. And make no mistake, Paul's not fighting with weapons of the flesh. He describes his ministry in 2 Corinthians. He says, we walk in the flesh. We do not wage war against the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power. And listen to this language, to destroy. What? Destroy what, Paul? Destroy strongholds. We will destroy arguments and every lofty opinion that's raised against the knowledge of God. So that's Paul saying, hey, a part of our identity, a part of our ministry as Christians is to destroy, but not with weapons of this world. We destroy with words. And our words are to make the doctrine and the beauty of Jesus preeminent. And that's what he does. He goes to war. He practices and models apologetics for us in this passage. He's not asking for an apology. He's giving a defense of the hope that he has. And I think there are three aspects to his grind here, right? As he's grinding in apologetics, the first thing, beloved, that he does is he listens and he learns. Now look at some of the verbs that you see in verse 23. As they summon him, and he's about to make his case, before he opens his mouth, he says, look, I perceive that in every way you are religious. I have watched you, and you are a very religious people. I passed along. I observed the objects of your worship. I found an altar with this inscription on it to the unknown God. Do you know what that means for Paul to actually take his time and to walk around the city and to look and to touch and to listen and then to read? I'm going to get so close to your altars that I can I can actually read what's on them. What is Paul doing before he makes his case to them? Guess what he's doing? He's learning and he's listening with his eyes and with his ears. He wants to understand what they trust in, what makes them feel important, what they're turning to for security and safety and satisfaction. And then he encounters, right, these Epicureans and these Stoics. R.C. Sproul says these were two rival and popular philosophical systems. Epicureans, in summary, and hear this out, Epicureans, God is so remote, and he takes no interest in the affairs of the world. He has no influence on the world. The world here is due to chance, and there is no survival after death, and there is no such thing as judgment because when we die, that's it, and therefore, their motto was to seek pleasure in this life here and now. That's Epicureans. What about the Stoics? There is a supreme God, but in a pantheistic way. He's in nature. The world is not governed by God because he's among us. It's governed by fate. And human beings must pursue their duty, resigning themselves to live in harmony with nature and reason, however painful this might be, and we're to develop our own self-sufficiency. I think Paul is taking this in because when he preaches the gospel, he destroys this logic. First thing as we think about grinding 
is listening. Second thing, he looks for God's common grace, even in the heart of idolaters. Theologians make a different distinction between common grace and saving grace. God gives believers and the elect saving grace. He opens our eyes that we would behold Jesus. And that is a miracle. That is a miracle. God causes you to see. And God causes you to turn. And God gives belief. And he is gracious to you. You can't earn it and you don't deserve it. But God gives common grace to non-believers. The reason that atheists can breathe is because God is giving him breath. The reason that idolater has food on the table is because every good and perfect gift still comes from God. They just don't know it. And what Paul is doing is, is looking for common grace. Where do I see God at work? And Eugene Peterson, he summarizes this beautifully. He says, as we think about ministry, we must work to cultivate an awareness that he calls prevenience. We must cultivate this idea that God seizes the initiative in ministry. He's the one who gets things going. He had and continues to have the first and last word. We must labor with this conviction that God has been working diligently, redemptively, and strategically before we even show up, before we are even aware that there is a thing for us to do. God has already been at work. It is a disciplined and determined conviction that everything we do is a response to his work. We learn to be attentive to the, the, the divine action already in process so that the previously unheard word of God is now noticed. Now, where do we see it in our passage? We see God's common grace in this other altar that they had. What were the inscriptions on the altar? To the unknown God. Now let that wash over you for a minute. They're in a city with thousands. Idolatry is teeming and it's full. But you know what the God of heaven and earth was doing to them? Sowing seeds of doubt in their hearts. Just in case we don't get it all, we got this unknown God. We can cover our bases there. Do you, do you understand that that is common grace? They could not have had that altar there. They could have thought that we got it all figured out. We know everything there is to know about religion, and it's right here. But something deep down inside of the Athenians had a place to the unknown God, just in case we don't know, just in case there is a God above what we presently know. We're going to make an altar for him. And Paul says, yes, that is it. That is common grace. God himself has sown that doubt in your heart. God himself has put that there for me on this particular day to preach to you about the God that you don't know about, but I'm here to tell you about him. Paul's starting point, beloved, after he listens, is to look for common grace. Where has God been? Where is God at work? Because that's where I'm going to start sharing the gospel. I'm going to start sharing it where God has already been on the move. And then Paul proceeds to tell them about this God, which is our third aspect. He's leading the conversation to Jesus. He's listening and learning. He's looking for common grace. Then he leads them to Jesus. This is so important because what Paul is doing is deconstructing Epicureanism and Stoicism. The Stoics, God is in nature. What Paul says, he ain't in nature. You think he needs humans? How can the creator of the earth, of the earth dwell in anything created by human hands? He doesn't need us. Your view of him is too small. He is above the heavens. No temple can contain him. The earth is his footstool. You are wrong. This unknown God, your view about him is wrong. It's too small. 
And you, you Epicureans, you think that God is remote and detached, that he has wound the earth up and has no affairs, no involvement in it. Hey, that's wrong. He's not only transcendent, you Stoics. He is imminent. He is near. He is so near that the first man created was Adam, and God formed him and breathed in him the breath of life. And from this one man that God made comes every single person that you see on the planet. And guess what? God's imminent is not just with us in creation. God's eminence is among us right now. In him we live and move and have our being. That's one of your own prophets, common grace. They're preaching to you the truth. And guess what? He has established your boundaries and your habitation, your place of dwelling, when you will be on the earth and where you will be and what family you're in and what city you're in. He has even orchestrated this day right here when Paul is saying, when I'm standing on your hill, that's not a God who is detached. That's a God who is near, who is orchestrating all of this right here, right now, that you may reach out and find him. That's how near he is. You Stoics are wrong. You Epicureans are wrong. And guess what? You both are wrong. There is life after death. And the proof of that is I know the man who was raised from the dead and his name is Jesus. And you can go and ask 500 witnesses. He is alive. He died under Roman leaders. He was raised and he did this to pay the debt for our sin. And he overcame the grave and he is alive, and you are wrong. And there is a judgment, and you both are wrong. There is a universal judgment for every man, every woman, every tribe, every child, on whoever lived the earth, and we will stand before him and give an account, and he will judge in righteousness. The time is over. The time of your ignorance is over. God is commanding and welcoming all to turn from your idols and to repent and to turn and bow the knee to Jesus. You see what Paul does? After listening, after looking for common grace, he presents the gospel. Why does this matter? As we think about the buffet of bad religious ideas in the world around us, you don't have to be intimidated, Christian. Islam, Mormonism, Kemetism, New Age thinking, relativism, Hinduism, Buddhism, and what any other isms that mankind will come up with, it's no match for the gospel. And you don't have to be afraid. You can engage and you can listen and you can learn and you can read their books and you can look for inconsistency in their logic and you can look for common grace where God has already been at work in their lives. And you'll see it. You'll see it in pandemics when people are afraid of dying. You'll see what they trust in. It's not your health. It's not your wealth. It's not your access to doctors. It's not you being fit. It's not you working out. There is a point, it's a time for every one of us to die. And some things we're powerless over. What are you trusting in? And it may be grief. They may lose a loved one. And their religious system does not help them grieve with hope. But as we sit with them in their grief, we can introduce them to the one who overcame the grave. 
We can help them to grieve with hope because we know that those who die in Jesus go be with Jesus, that Jesus will never leave us, never forsake us, even in death. And through our union with him, beloved, we have a confidence that is unshakable. We can grieve, but we can do so with hope. Sometimes when people lose everything they've they've amassed in this life, sometimes they need to be reminded that naked you came into the the world and naked you leave the world so obviously the sum total of life is not to accumulate stuff and baby maybe God is bringing this about to let your all and all be in him and not in the stuff you have that the options are limitless that when people are going through the crashing of their systems that common grace is there and for us beloved we got manifold ways we can lead them to our great and beautiful Jesus You don't have to be afraid. And if you're here this morning and your trust is in someone or something other than Christ, it will crumble. It is transient. It is deceptive. It is evil. And God calls you to a son. He says, come to him, bow to him, turn from your sins, rest in him. And that just judge will give you peace and hope unimaginable right now and forever. That's grinding. Last thing we see in our passage is the grace of God through the witness. What's beautiful about the Exodus 20 passage is God does not just say that he is jealous. He says he is also merciful and abounding in steadfast love to a thousand generations of those who love him. So what you see in the character of God is justice, but also grace and mercy. And what you see in our passage this morning, Paul is grieved. Paul grinds and proclaims the good news. And guess what happens to some of those in Athens? Some of them mock, but not all of them. Some of them believe. Some men joined him and believed, among whom were Dionysius the Areopagite, who was some prominent man who worked at the Areopagus and a woman named Demarius and others. Why is that there? Why is that there? It's to remind you and I Christians that God rescues the world through his son. But God is pleased, and I think we got to hear this. He is pleased to rescue some through the labors of people that look like you and me. Why would he entrust that to us? That is so amazing and profound that the God of heaven and earth would alter our present and our eternities, that he would offer the world the greatest gift it's ever received, that he would give us peace and joy and hope, that he would begin to put things back together and fix and redeem, and that he would be pleased to use you and me. This is encouragement that the grace of God comes through his witnesses as we give defenses of the faith. And the point is not to draw attention to us, it's to the God who opens hearts and gives faith. This is why Paul could say, he who plants is nothing. He who waters is nothing. But it's God who gives the increase. It's God who works through what we do to bring glory to his name. That's an encouragement for us to open our mouths. May it be so. Let's pray. Father, we bless you and we thank you. We thank you that you have caused us to see and us to know 
and us to find no greater joy than knowing and walking with you. Father, our hearts break over children, over spouses, over co-workers, over neighbors who don't know you. And if it doesn't, Lord, your word says it should. Father, forgive us for dropping the ball here. Thank you that there is grace to cover our disobedience. Father, I pray that you will equip us to proclaim the truth in love using words and our actions. Father, I pray for those that we know that are on our hearts who are walking in rebellion away from you. Holy Spirit, arrest their hearts. Use us, Father, in your kingdom to bring people to a saving knowledge of you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.